join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Mark Campbell. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, you having me here tonight. So as Susan said, I, I've been privileged to work in a, a variety of domains. I sort of consider myself to be, uh, my research to be in the general area of autonomy, but I've, I've been able to work in the area of space, air, as well as robotics. And uh, I've had a number of collaborations with the computer scientists as well as engineers because it's such a, uh, a very rich domain. And so uh, I, I hopefully have a unique perspective that uh, will, uh, um, you'll be able to see tonight. I'm going to focus a little bit tonight on this, uh, this word uh, called intelligence. So even though I work a lot in autonomous systems, the, the, the question that uh, at least I always ponder with my students is whether uh, the, the, the actual systems we're building are truly intelligent and what exactly does that mean. So uh, with that, hopefully we'll have a little bit of a journey and we'll, we'll decide together whether we uh, are there yet or not. So I'm going to start simple. Um, I'm going to start with a washing machine. Okay, so. Uh, this is an autonomous system. Uh, roughly about a year ago, my uh, uh, wife had been talking to me about getting a new washing machine, and I'd been resisting. And, and coincidentally, about a year ago, it mysteriously sort of died. So we got a new one. <laughs> we, we got a new one. She wanted one of these nice front loader machines and things like that. And, and I have to say, you know, we had a very old washing machine before this, but it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you, you throw everything in there, you put the soap in, and you press play. And it's, it's really a play button. And there's a pause button and everything like that. And the dryer is exactly the same. And it really truly is an autonomous system. There's sensing on board. It makes adjustments along the way and, and those types of things. So, so in, the, in the definition of an, an autonomous system, it truly is that. Um, something a little bit more close to home um, is the Roomba, the iRobot Roomba. So I typically ask this. How many people have Roombas at home? So, so usually the, the, uh, the, the students are, you know, have a few, few more hands up in the air. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is the Roomba, if, you've ever, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's, a, it's an autonomous vacuum cleaner made by a company called iRobot. Um, it, this is an interesting picture. This is just a, um, a picture of the path uh, that this takes in the middle of the night. Okay, so what happens is you just press play on this, and in the middle of the night, it will vacuum. It'll go around your, uh, uh, the legs of your tables and those types of things and go back into home base and charge up during the day. So it's really, it's, it's pretty phenomenal. So, but you can actually see the paths, right? You can see some curling and things like that. So there's actually something inside of it uh, that really allows it to do these types of things. So we actually have uh, versions of these, or one of my colleagues does, without the vacuum, and we use them in labs now. Um, and they're sensing on site. It basically just bumps up against each other. So it's not the smartest thing. It just kind of moves around. But you can see there are some smarts inside of it, right? So then, you know, so then the question is, are these systems truly intelligent? Right? And so that's sort of the driving uh, question of what we're going to do tonight. So I have one picture here for you um, <laughs> th that shows uh, something that happens every once in a while. So, so you can see it's, it's got a little bit of a tail here. Okay? So you, you can imagine that if you're doing that and, and vacuuming your, uh, uh, your place, uh, you're probably not going to let that happen. And it, and it starts to lead us at least into the idea of what intelligent means. Because this is something new that came up in the room but just couldn't actually handle it. So there's a lot more examples of autonomy. These are more complex examples, of course. There's, there's new aircraft. Um, uh, of course, Curiosity uh, is, is making a big splash, uh, which is just amazing day by day. Um, and if you've ever seen this, um, this is the PR2 robot, a personal robot 2 uh, robot uh, from a company called Willow Garage. And uh, they have some very interesting programs where they've actually tried to give away some of the, uh, some of the robots to universities and engage them in research looking at the personal robotics. Okay? So it's very, very nice. Um, my, my area of research, uh, we've done a little bit of work uh, over the la last five or six years in autonomous driving. So this is just a picture of our car. It's a, it's a Chevy Tahoe. And uh, this was part of a competition about five years ago, actually not too far from here. And uh, these are just a few highlights of, uh, of a competition that we were in. It, we roughly drove about 60 miles in this kind of environment. You see us coming up to to a, to a stop line. Uh, there's uh, there's uh, traffic in different areas. There are some smaller buildings. There's some people behind concrete barriers. So you, <laughs> it gives you a little bit of an idea where the trust factor was uh, with, with us there. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, uh, there was a, a, the competition lasted um, uh, for a fairly long time. It went to semifinals and finals. And in the end, there was roughly about six 
uh, or there was uh, uh, six robots that made it to the end and, and traveled the whole distance. So it was nearly 60 miles, about six hours of autonomous driving, uh, interacting with robots as well as human-driven cars. And so, so a lot of the examples I'm going to give you tonight um, are, are based on this. I like using this example uh, because most people drive. Most people have some ideas of things that go well and not so well when you drive. Uh, most people train their kids how to drive and things like that. So um, I'm going to use that as, uh, as one of the driving examples, uh, sprinkled in with a few other examples, especially from some of my colleagues. So again, the question I'll ask is, uh, are these systems truly intelligent? So this is something that happened in the competition. So we're sitting here. You're going to see a view in just a minute. There's a cement barrier sitting right in here. So here's the cement barrier. This is our car. And we're a little confused, OK? Um, we actually think this cement barrier is a car blocking the road, OK? So obviously, that doesn't make sense. Uh, this is another uh, robot that got a little antsy. Uh, got a little frustrated with this, and, and that's actually something you could really see a human driver doing, right? You know, you come up behind and it's like, I'm not going to wait anymore, I'm just going to go. Um, so, uh, so this happened, right? And, and for the most part, I think when we look at this uh, example, um, most people, most human drivers would, would have overcome this. So the big question is, why did this happen, right? And so like a true academic uh, that we all are, we, we wrote a paper about it, about the collision. <laughs> And um, we, we really tried to get to the bottom of why these things happen, and, and because we learn from our uh, failures. And, and uh, uh, so a couple of the things that are in this talk are actually outgrowths of those types of things. OK, so what I want to do is talk about this thing called this, this uh, sort of the idea that we have, which is called the chain of decision making. And, and you can think of this in terms of robotics. Um, so the idea is the following. Most robots have some type of sensors. The, the, the Roomba robot has, doesn't have a lot of sensing, typically bumps up against something and things like that. But if you look at the autonomous car that we have, it has a lot of sensors. And I'll get into those in just a minute. So I, I put a few more lines in there. Okay? And so that's one thing that, in terms of autonomy, autonomous systems, getting more and more sensors is typically getting easier these days. Um, so then what happens is you have this perception block, okay? And so this perception block, the way I like to think of it, is you're trying to take this gobs and gobs of data and bring it down into information that you can use, okay? And you're going to see in a minute how much data that you have. It is a lot. And the question is, how do you transform that into a usable set of data or information or whatever you want to call it, such that you can move on to the last block, which is planning or decision making or so on, okay? So, so the final thing is that you have to figure out what you're going to do, and then you have to base it on this information. So how do you actually do that, right? So, so most of what I'm going to uh, talk about is, is uh, in terms of robotics. But the interesting part, sort of the, the goal that I drive home to my students is that, is that the human drivers are still much, much better. And it's not even just that. I mean, human drivers are very good at, at just cl you know, cluttered environments, driving alongside cyclists and those types of things. Can watch out for cyclists if they're, if they're not doing uh, very good interactive kinds of things with the, the people. Um, this is a picture of my niece driving along in just a, uh, just a car this summer. And I, I was always convinced, especially in this uh, competition, that if I took my eight-year-old son at the time and trained him, you, took 10% of the time I put into development of the car and trained him on how to drive the car, he'd do better. So, so why is that, right? So, so the, and, and I think it goes to this idea of, of intelligence. So the question is, why are people better at some of these tasks? Because a lot of things that happen, clearly, uh, they wouldn't do. So uh, uh, like a good logical engineer, the first thing I did is, is go to the dictionary and look at what intelligence actually means, right? So it's the ability to learn or understand or reason about new or trying situations. This, and it, uh, the second part is the skilled use of reason. So, in essence, this is kind of the driver for me. And the key words here are really the learning part and the reasoning about part. Okay? And so that, that to me, is a sign of, of real intelligence, where you are trained or in, in one area, but you can apply that knowledge and do something else that's similar. Okay? And, and driving is, is, is one example. As you get better and better in driving, uh, typically you can handle uh, situations that arise that you may have not been uh, trained before. Okay? So let me go now back to this uh, chain of decision making. And I want to update it a little bit just with some extra information, just to show you um, really what, where my thoughts are on some of these things now. So this is the same thing we have right now. And we have this, this chain. okay? And an important part of this chain to understand is that any of these things 
if you have any problem in any, at any point along this chain, that's why I call it a chain, you're going to have a problem. So if you have really bad sensors, you can have the best planning and decision-making algorithms known to, to people, anyone. Uh, and it doesn't really matter because you just have bad sensors and so on. So if, if, you, if you just don't make very good uh, plans or your perception algorithms aren't very good, it doesn't really matter if you have the best sensors. So it really truly is a chain and you really, really have to work uh, at, at the, the weak links of those chains to kind of be able to work on that. So understanding the chain a little bit better is probably pretty important, especially in the context of, of the definition of intelligence. So the first thing I'm going to do is, is add a little bit more context to these red blocks. So data, information, and decisions. The first is that the data coming out is uncertain. So what I mean by that, it has some type of sensor noise, or if you do processing on that data, it's going to make mistakes and those types of things. Okay? So the bottom line is, 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 is you might have a lot of data, uh, but it's also uncertain. The second thing is that the information coming out is probabilistic. It's not perfect. Okay? Uh, and it may, in some instances, be better than what a human can do, and in some instances, it can be worse. Okay, the example we saw in the, in the collision, uh, the perception was that the concrete barrier was a car, right? So that's a mistake. That was a probabilistic piece of information. If we would have captured it correctly, uh, we might have been able to use that information slightly differently. Um, uh, as well as other things like how far objects are away from you and those types of things. These are the things that robots are typically very, very good at. And then the final one is, is uh, decisions uh, which are deterministic. Okay, I always tell people that when you come up to a four-way stop sign, uh, you don't turn right 70% of the way, right? You're going to turn right or you're going to go straight or something like that. So you're going to make a very, very d deterministic decision, but the key is you have to base it on probabilistic information. So a lot of what my group has do been doing, especially since this competition uh, in 2007, is really looking at the linkages between these two. Uh, because in essence, uh, they have to work together. And a lot of the research community has grown up just in one area or the other area and haven't, haven't really brought these things together. That's a really nice thing about these competitions because it actually uh, forced people to bring all these things together. Okay? And it really, in, in my opinion, uh, really pushed the envelope a little bit. Okay, so on top of all this, uh, we have this what I'll call intelligent reasoning and learning. Okay? And so uh, I tried to figure out where this would actually fit in, but the, uh, the idea of reasoning and learning really could be ubiquitous in any of these uh, different blocks. Okay? So, uh, so I just sort of put it uh, all through here, and I'll give some examples of that. So in essence, what I, uh, what I think right now is that the true intelligent autonomous systems require three things. It requires a robust data to information to decision path. So this path has to be robust. Okay, in, in, in terms of where the weak links are. Okay, they have to be matched fairly well and, and, and those types of things. Um, we have to have the ability to reason about things that are going along this path. And finally, we have to have the ability to learn. Okay? So what I'm going to do is kind of walk through uh, different elements of this block and just give some examples. Uh, some examples that we've done in research and some examples that happen in the competition as well as a sprinkling or two from, from different colleagues, okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, start in the upper left here. So I'm just, this is sort of my icon, if, uh, if you will, about uh, where I'm going to be walking through. So the, the first thing is, as I mentioned, there's a lot of data, okay? So this is our autonomous car. Um, we've done uh, a couple of different updates on it, but I put this picture up just so you can see some of the sensors. Um, there's a 64 scan LiDAR, which is sort of the, 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 the big sensor, okay? And you're going to see that in just a minute. Um, there's uh, radar in the front, uh, there's cameras in the front, and, and so on. So uh, effectively, the main sensors we have looking out are radar, um, lasers or LIDAR, and vision. Okay? Uh, and uh, we have some other internal sensors like GPS and those, those types of things, but these are the external sensors. So I'm going to show a movie here um, for two, that shows two of the sensors. Now this is a little bit dark, but hopefully you'll be able to see it. If, you can see these different lines here. These different lines are the LIDAR, okay? So what happens is this LIDAR right here is spinning, and it's 64 scans, so it's basically spraying the entire area with LIDAR points, okay? And so the interesting part about all this data is it's all range data, whereas if you compare it to the picture here, the same picture, uh, these, these are uh, time synchronized, uh, pretty close anyways, um, is that uh, this gives angular information, gives intensity information, and so on. So it, they're complementary sources of information. But all of these are coming at uh, 20 hertz, okay? So you'll be able to see this in just a minute. 
So as you're driving along, here we're not autonomous driving uh, through uh, Cornell's campus. I don't think the lawyers would let me do that. But um, we're driving down here. This is, this is what we call college town sometimes. And the interesting thing to see, this is a typical thing you see. You know, I'm following another car and so on. What's interesting about this is look at this data. It's amazing. You see sidewalks. You can see people. You can see gradients. Okay, um, and uh, you can. This is sort of the edge. You can see the sidewalks and those types of things. We're going to come up here in just a minute. And you're going to see people crossing the road. One person. I think this was at the holiday break, and one person has a has a bag with them, and and so you see them crossing. But you can see them directly in here. You can see shadows. So you can see lidar shadows behind them. It's it's an amazing sensor. It really, really is. It doesn't have as much range as the vision camera. But it's, it's really, truly an amazing sensor. And most of the finalists who, who were in the competition ended up having uh, this sensor. So the bottom line is, 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 if you look at this and then you compare it to us who drive, okay, this is an amazing amount of data. Okay? And then the question is, how is it processed and how is it used? So, so if you're sort of keeping score and comparing humans to, to robots in terms of driving, uh, just in terms of data, uh, the, uh, the robot wins. Um, so one of the things we've been working on in terms of research, this comes through, this is a, this is a little hard to, to see, but we've added a 360 camera on the top. So this looks like a little, bit, a little bit funny, but this is a panorama view, 360 degrees sitting on top of the uh, car. This is the spinning LiDAR unit, okay? And then this is the LiDAR overlaid now on top of the vision sensor, okay? And now we're just uh, uh, driving around and, and seeing different things. So the interesting part about this is, is not only do you have vision and you can see things like cars and those types of things, but you also have range data. You know how far away things are. Okay? So the thing, some of the things we've been exploring is putting these together and really creating a super sensor. So it's sort of like having your eyes, but then I can tell how far away everything is as well. And you can, you can imagine how powerful those types of things are. Okay? Um, so... Uh, I, I have a, uh, uh, an example here from a colleague, Noah Snavely, at Cornell. He's in the computer science department. And, and I put this up here because I, ca I call it the holy grail, which is 3D reconstruction. Uh, so uh, let me just give you an example here. So what Noah does is he takes, he downloads all these pictures from Flickr, and he estimates or he tries to construct uh, a 3D version of whatever he's looking at. So this is what's interesting. If you look at these, these are all different pictures of the Statue of Liberty. Okay, and so he's just flipping through them because they're all uh, effectively trying to estimate the same kind of thing. Okay, and he put it in fa one fairly large uh, estimation process, and he's trying to uh, do a 3D reconstruction of the entire thing. Okay, now the interesting thing to look at this is this is just the uh, uh, just the pictures of the raw data. The other thing that can be done is the following. This is Rome's Colosseum. So all of these right here are the places where the pictures were taken. And then this is the Colosseum basically put together, you want to think of this as, as basically just dots, put together as just dots. So you can imagine a full 3D reconstruction of the Colosseum in this way, simply by your pictures that you uploaded from Flickr. Okay? And all he did was download the, the pictures. They didn't have GPS tag data or anything like that. If they had that, it would have been an easier problem to solve. All he did was say that, oh, you're, you're um, uh, taking the picture of the same thing, and I'm going to try to put them all together. So it's really a, a pretty interesting work. So you can imagine he has some uh, videos of actually uh, uh, different elements of small cities, okay? And so you can reconstruct those. So you can imagine it's, it, it could be pretty powerful if we, we would want to do that. Um, certainly more powerful than we do as drivers. We don't reconstruct the city in our mind as we're driving along. Um, but this is not there either. I mean, you can imagine computationally how hard this is to do, and it actually is. Um, the, uh, so let me talk a little bit about the, um, the next block here, which is the perception block, okay? So the perception block in this case, uh, this is going now from data to information, okay? And so I've, I've, I've taken a still picture here of our car um, as it's driving through our college town, and I put up some, some questions here that you have to ask in this perception block. So this is the car, and I have to ask things like, where am I? Okay, where am I in the world? And I, am I in the right lane? Okay, where I am in the world tells me where I need to be driving sometime in the future, and uh, you know, and I need to be in the right-hand lane, at least over here in the U.S., uh, in order to be driving correctly and following the rules of the law. But there's other things in the environment. You can see these are parked cars. There's a car here that's uh, double parked, may take off at some point. Uh, you can't really see it, but there's a couple of cyclists up here on the left. 
okay? And so it's a fairly cluttered and crowded environment. So you ask things like, um, is this a car up here uh, that's further away? How fast is it moving? Is it moving at all? Will it take off? Um, so these are just some of the questions that you want to ask, okay? So these are the kind of things you have to be asking. Typically when we're driving, we're always asking these types of things. So um, I'm going to go through just a couple of examples of perception, just sort of a slide on each, just to, give you an, uh, just to give you an idea where I think things are in terms of the state of the art. So the first one is the question about where, where am I? Okay, and this is just uh, uh, localization. Uh, so most people have GPS systems in their, car, in their car or something like that. And that's okay, not quite good enough to drive on. Uh, you have to have a little bit more. But you, uh, at least in today's world, or for our roboticists, you can pretty much get to the point where you can drive on a road um, using all the sensors. So you have to have a little bit more than GPS. This is a GPS system. We uh, also use an inertial measurement unit. Uh, IMU has rate gyros and accelerometers. That sort of smooths out the solution. And then finally, sometimes we use the um, odometry that's in the uh, ABS wheels. Uh, and then finally, we actually use vision. And so we use vision to find the lanes and so on. So just to give you an idea, this is a picture now of, you can see just sort of the outline of a city block. And the truth is in black, which is a little hard to see. Um, the, uh, the, the blue dotted lines is if you turn GPS off and you just used uh, the IMU sensor. Uh, and if you do that, you get this, you don't stay on the road, bottom line, okay? Um, however, if you use vision and you use the IMU, even if you don't have GPS, you can actually stay on the road, even if you have a 30-minute blackout. So basically what it means is that if you have a GPS fix as you're going into downtown Manhattan, uh, you should be able to stay on the road. Okay, so in, in essence, there's a lot of maturity to this question uh, at the moment. Uh, the second uh, area of uh, perception is obstacle tracking. So this is just looking out on the environment and, and looking at all the obstacles. And you want to ask some questions. Um, what's the type of obstacle? Is it a person? Uh, is it a, is it a, um, a car or a, a cement barrier, for instance? Um, where is it? What is its speed? And those types of things, okay? So at least on our car, we had these three different sensors, as I mentioned before, and they each have pluses and minuses, okay? Uh, and so you can kind of see that. Radar, at least the one that we had, had a fairly narrow band. So you got to put a bunch of them in our front bumper, and then there was gaps in between. Uh, and it also pretty much just gives you velocity, right? Which is the, why it's, uh, um, the police officers use it so much. <laughs> um, and uh, so vision is very, very nice because it's fairly inexpensive. It has a pretty good range. Um, but the problem is, is that you typically have all these pixels of data coming in and trying to differentiate a car from another car, especially as they're passing or in a cluttered environment, there tends to be a lot more mistakes, okay? So, so taking that data to information is a really hard step. And then finally you have LiDAR, and I showed you the LiDAR, uh, the 64 scan LiDAR. Um, it gives you position information, range, which is very, very nice. But the problem is you have just a lot of that data, so you have to reduce it in some way. So um, this is my uh, uh, one equation to show you I can still do a little bit of math. Um, and, uh, but I, I want to I just give you an idea of a class of estimators or perception algorithms that we do, uh, that we use, and just to give you an idea. So the idea is this is what you want to find. This is a probability density, for those of you who don't know the, nom the nomenclature. And I'm trying to find the probability of the state x. You can think of this as the location of an object or the identity of an object. It's sort of whatever I want to know is what x is. And then this uh, says, given the fact that I have data z. Okay, so that's really what I want. I want to know what's the location of the cars all around me, given the fact that I just had a big scan of LiDAR data. That's, that's the question I want to ask. And so what we do is we decompose it into two parts. And the main thing is this is a hypothesis-driven formulation. The idea here is that you have uh, a bunch of different hypotheses, which could be something like this is a cement barrier versus this is a car, and they each are different hypotheses, and they each have different probabilities. Um, and then, so this is the probability that one is true versus the other. And then what this is, is this is saying, well, given that the hypothesis is true, and the fact that I have data, now let me do an estimator. And this problem is much easier to solve, okay? So really what we do is we break this down into a sum of hypotheses of the environment, and then as we collect data, we let the probabilities of those hypotheses move around. Okay? So that's the key part, is the probability each changes as more data is collected. And effectively, the, the thing I really like about this is this is how we deal with it as well, right? If, if, if there's a car that's very far in the distance and I can't tell if it's in a lane, I'm going to keep watching it a little bit more and a little bit more, right? 
I'm going to collect more data through my eyes until I have a higher probability of it, whether it's in its lane or not. So, so it's a very, very natural way of doing it. It's very flexible. So um, this is just an example of, uh, from the, uh, from the um, uh, competition. Uh, so this is our car here. Um, this is the road network. This is one of the semifinal tests that they did to try to get into the finals. And there's lanes this way, and there's lanes this way, and then you have this cross area. So what you had to do is you had to go around the right-hand side here like this. So you had to merge into traffic and then come around here and cross traffic. Okay? And all these circles here are obstacles that we're tracking. So what we did is we tried to find all car-sized obstacles because we knew there wasn't going to be cyclists or pedestrians or those types of things. Now you can tell all these things aren't cars, but what they are is they are car-sized things. That's why we got confused between the, different, be, between the car and the cement barrier. It turns out they're roughly the same length. Okay, because it, it happened to be sticking out a little bit. Okay, um, but this is an example of different things, uh, and there was a bunch of cars going back and forth, and, and this is a test of safety. Okay, um, all these are human driven. Uh, this is Ford, uh, all Ford Tauruses with roll bars and uh, uh, stunt people driving them. So they were they they knew where they were going as well. So built now on top of that, the fact that I now I, I know I have a hundred obstacles in my view that, are, that may or may not be cars. Now what I have to do is I have to reason about them. So we did do some reasoning in this competition. Okay, so we have to reason about the things and we have to answer these questions. Okay, these are very similar to the questions I asked before. Is the obstacle now a car or not? Okay, we had to look at it. If it was moving, clearly it was a car. If it wasn't moving, then we weren't quite sure. Okay, um, so we can ask things like what lane it is and those types of things. And so this is a scenario, an example of, of just something that, that a lot of these things come to bear, which is an intersection. Uh, and we saw this in one of the videos, but I'll play it, I'll play it again from the, from the robot's perspective. So this is the robot coming in. There's a few objects around it. But the bottom line is, is that it's a four-way stop sign. And while I'm coming in to stop here, there was one waiting here, there's one waiting here, and one waiting here. So the challenge with this is that as one car passes in front of the other one, then uh, it block the sensors get blocked, and I can't see any of the other ones. We call those occlusions. Okay, and so this is an example of that. So what happens is this car moved from here, and it occludes this one right here. So you can imagine that if you just clear that out of your obstacle tracker, uh, you're going to pull out before the other one is there. And so intersection precedence was also something that was very very important. So this is an example that shows you. This is the view from the front of our car. Um, and this is us coming in. Okay, so this is our um, uh, a following car, just to just to uh, keep us safe. And you can see all of these things are car-sized objects. So you can do reason about this and say, well, this is probably not a car because it's not even on the road. You can say things like that, but you have to be a little careful. So the thing is, if you watch this, it's flickering a little bit because of our sensor uncertainty. It comes across, and we lose track of this. Okay technically in the sensor data, but inside of our estimator, based on our hypothesis-driven approach, we, we assume that it could still be there because we don't have any sensor data behind it to clear it out. Okay? Um, and so what happens is as these things turn, you're going to see different things happening. Um, uh, if you watch this one, this one sort of, you, you can see it sort of breaks up. And the reason it breaks up is we lost it in our sensor view. So, uh, uh, and, and once it uh, goes out of our sensor view, we try to hold on to it for a little while uh, and do our best and then, and then move on. Okay, so uh, what happens here? The question is, even with these sensors, uh, we had more sensor data than people, we have some pretty sophisticated perception algorithms, we still had an accident, even though we were doing a little bit of reasoning. So the question is why? Um, so as I mentioned, I think one argument that we've been making, and this has sort of been the focus of our research over the past few years, is that uh, the reasoning that we're doing is just not good enough yet. It's certainly not to the level of what a human is. It's just uh, the word we use all the time is brittle. Okay, it, it, you know, it, if, you make a, if there's a problem with it or if there's a mistake, it's a, it's a catastrophic mistake, okay, like a collision or something like that. So what do you want to do? So this is something that we didn't do in the um, competition, and it's really the cause, uh, at least from our side of the view, uh, of, of the accident. And that is that if, if we're coming up to an intersection right here and we have another car coming in this way, um, they have multiple things that can be doing, and what you'd like to do is predict those into the future. So this one could go straight, it could go right, it could go left, and if I want to turn left here, I have to take all of those things into account. Okay? And we didn't really do that all that well. When MIT was coming around us, okay, we did not predict that they would actually come right in front of us. It just was not in anything that we'd ever tested, and it was just not in any, in any of our algorithms. 
This is a temporal-based pr prediction. Um, it's reasoning based on time, not just space. Okay? And there's some issues with that, primarily computationally. Okay? Um, it just makes it um, uh, you know, really, really hard. If you can imagine, the, you know, the example I give people, if you're driving down the road and you have another car coming at you, if you, if you thought about it and listed out everything that that car could do, okay, your answer to driving would be to stop and not drive anymore. <laughs> right? If you really wanted to be safe, that's what you would do. So in essence, you're trusting that that person is going to stay on the road. So how do you encode trust in an algorithm, right? Um, and and it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty tricky thing to do, obviously. So, um, so this is uh, one of the things we've been doing. And um, we call this probabilistic anticipation. So this is the robot now. And it's the same kind of thing. Uh, we're going to see this in a couple of different views. This is the robot. This is the car. And you're going to see these. Um, you're going to see uh, its position. This is a probability density, so, so it's, there's probability hills, uh, effectively, and they are predicted out in the future. So we're pausing things just to give you an idea of what the robot is thinking while it's doing these types of things. And there's a couple things. It, they blow up as you're going on he, uh, as you go out, because what could happen, it could slow down, speed up, and those types of things. So it gets bigger, and then when it gets to intersections, it can turn right or turn left, so it actually can split. Okay. So this is a nice a way of doing some type of temporal reasoning. Um, you can expand this a little bit uh, to um, a uh, very dangerous set of intersections. Uh, and so uh, what we did is we, we, we tried to look at scaling here, and we put a, a, a bunch of different cars in here. Uh, the blue cars, the obstacles uh, aren't obeying any laws except for staying on the road. Okay? So they don't care whether you're turning right or left or anything like that. So we wanted to evaluate to see how well we could do in a fairly dangerous environment. Um, and so you can see when these things pause, there's two cars, when these things pause, you're going to see the prediction happening and so on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the planning in just a minute, but this is a little bit of uh, some of the things we're doing. The idea here now is to try to give it the, 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 uh, the car a little bit more reasoning uh, as you're going along. Uh, so now let me look at the last block here, which is the, uh, the planning block, which is really information to decisions. How do we go from, from there to there? So again, I go back to my scenario here. And uh, so this is maybe a path I want to take. I want to go around this car, and then maybe I want to turn left. So the questions I, ha uh, the things I have to do in terms of my planning and decision making is I have to stay in my own lane. I have to avoid these cars, you know, especially if one pulls out or something like that. I have to avoid this car as I go around it. Um, and then I want to turn left, OK? So most of the time, what, what happens in planning and decision making is, is people break this down into short time scales and long time scales. Okay, and so I'm just briefly going to give you uh, an example of these, and then we're going to go through some, some, uh, some videos just to show you how these things work. Um, I, I broke these down into two. There's, there's more complexity that goes into this, but it, it, it's easiest for me to explain it just in terms of two. The path planning one uh, is, is shown by this um, uh, uh, figure right here. So let's say this is the robot. And in the robot, I have a map, and I have a mission, so I know which way I'm going to go. Okay? Not unlike what you would get actually you know, from your GPS or something like that. So what I have now, because I have the map, is I can figure out where the lane lines are. If I'm detecting where other cars are, I can put boundaries around those. And then I have an initial condition, which is this purple, which is, if you want to think of it, is like the output of your GPS, your Garmin or something like that. Right? And now what I do is I use optimization methods to smooth this around such that the car is not jerking around and things like that. In essence, that's it. And there's many different ways of doing this. In the competition, I can probably name six or seven ways of doing this, and they all actually work quite well. So effectively, path planning has, has worked pretty well. There are some issues with integrating in with obstacles and things like that. Um, this, was, this is actually what happened on MIT's uh, um, side, is that their perception uh, wasn't quite working very good. So things that were under five miles an hour were considered to be static and not moving. Okay? So we were going slow, and they considered us not to be moving. So they, they, in order to draw these boxes around here, that's what they had to do. Okay? Then finally, you have goal planning. And the easiest way to explain this is sort of a fancy version of your Garmin. Right? I know that in two miles, I want to turn right, and, and those types of things. Okay? So in essence, that's what t uh, um, people typically do. The path planning is, is what's going to happen in the next few seconds. Okay? Make sure I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to have any collisions and stay on the road, whereas this is decision over minutes or tens of seconds and minutes and so on. Okay, And so we also did a little bit of reasoning on the planning side uh, in the competition, as most people did. And so I, I would argue here, this is, this is sort of an important point here, the currently successful autonomous systems, like these robots that were able to drive 60 miles an hour, um, 
they really relied heavily on testing followed by updating the algorithms in the software. Okay? If you look at anything, if you look at you know, any of your software, if you look at you know, the, the airplanes that we're talking about, they typically go through many, many tests. All right? um, uh, and and uh, companies especially are much better at this than universities, trying to get the students to actually do any of these regression tests or something like that is very hard. Um, they want to discover the next, next new thing. Um, but I would argue that, the, that the, the teams that did really, really well were the teams that actually tested. So everybody had something here, what I, you know, some type of failure detection or recovery. So this is an example that I gave, just a conceptual example. So if, if the car's not moving for 30 seconds, okay, and I'm conf the, car, the robot's confused, I have to put logic in there such that it's just not going to you know, just stop. And comp you know. So what I do is I just reset the tracker. I just clear everything out of my head, and I just reset it and collect more data. If, if, if another 60 seconds go by, I move back and forth, maybe get a different view of things. right? And then if I'm not moving for 120 seconds, I say, hey, the heck with it. I'm going to kind of open up my uh, uh, constraints and just try to see if I can drive a little bit slowly and make sure I don't collide with anything, but kind of go slowly. And in essence, this cycle was exactly what we were doing when we were caught right by uh, when we had that collision. We were moving back and forth trying to clear out of sensors because the, the, the map uh, uh, waypoint was very, very close to the concrete barrier. So it looked like the, the road was blocked, even though it was a very, very wide road. So it took us two minutes for us to clear that out. And, and unfortunately, we went back to that point 18 times during the competition. So 18 times we sat there for about two minutes trying to clear things up. Um, not, not very fun because it was actually right in front of us too. So we, we, we got to watch that all the time. Um, so I, I call this uh, learning with humans in the loop because what's happening is that, is that uh, we would go out and test and uh, figure out what was going on, go back and fix the software, and add some of these things on, and then just kind of move on, right? And every team had these, and the teams that built these up in a more sophisticated manner because of more testing and things like that, um, the better they did. You know, it's, it's not unlike, uh, you know, uh, my 10-year-old soccer team. If they, if they um, train for three days a week as opposed to one day a week, the three-day-a-week team will, will actually win. Um, so uh, I'm going to show a few movies. This is just a, uh, um, a legend of things that you're actually going to be able to see. So the robot is sitting in here. Um, all of these things that are flickering on the outside are obstacles. And the dashed lines here, red and blue just means right and left. And the dashed lines are going to shift back and forth around obstacles. So I want to give you an idea of how these things shift over time. Because we're refreshing this at a 10 hertz rate. 10 times a second, we're replanning a new path. Okay. So this is an example. This is actually what the robot sees in terms of the camera. This is actually what it's thinking. Okay? Um, and you're going to see things as I go around here. You can see these things sort of shift back and forth. It'll be a little bit easier when we come up to these two. So there's some barrels in here. Um, and this is the initial path. And then we're smoothing that path out. So as we go around, there's obstacles that just shift the constraints back and forth. And 10 times a second, we're solving a numerical optimization problem um, and passing it passing basically on to the, uh, to the steering and, and uh, brake and those types of things. So, so, this, uh, so this really worked pretty well. So I'm going to give you a couple of other examples. Um, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that the accident was the highlight of our, uh, <laughs> of our competition. So we actually did a few things right. Um, uh, some things I think, at least for me, I was pretty impressed. Um, so so uh, this is one example that um, we didn't quite realize until after the competition. But we actually did a pass on a four-lane highway. So this is our car. Here and what happened is that there's a robot here that's going a little bit slower. We were going about 25 miles an hour. They're going 15. And then the, this is a trailer car. So every robot had a trailer car. So we're going to come up behind them. Um, you're going to see us hesitate uh, as we go along here. We're going to hesitate right behind here. And the reason we hesitate is we're trying to figure out whether that car is in the right lane or not. Because it can't pass it if it's in the right or left. And we don't even see the robot until we actually get up right in front of it. So this is a pretty good example of actually some reasoning that we actually did. So again, this is, this is what the view from the car. So you can see, I mean, it's a bit grainy, but you can't even see the car, the car in front of it. This is our car. Um, this is our trailer car. This is a bunch of junk. Um, and you can see this is flickering back and forth. And right now, we're confused. We don't know whether there's two obstacles or one obstacle, because it's, it's right on the boundary of our sensing. So we, we come out here, but then we slow down. We slow down to roughly 15 miles an hour. You see, we, we still have two objects. And all of a sudden, um, we figure out it's one object. We figure out it's in the right-hand lane. And we start to speed up. 
So in my mind, I mean, we didn't see this until after the, after the competition. We looked at the data. This is a pretty good job of reasoning about uncertain situations, right? Because we weren't quite sure. We didn't, you know, if, if that would have been in left-hand lane, we would have slowed down and, and, and actually stopped. So, so it did, a, a, in my mind, a pretty, pretty nice job. Um, this is a second example of a wrong way car, okay? So this is an example of a one-way street when this is coming down here. Um, and uh, the, um, uh, we're coming down, we're following two other uh, objects, and a car is coming up the, the wrong way, uh, uh, coming up the wrong way. So this is something we definitely did not test, a one-way road with a car coming the wrong way. Um, so this is uh, a bit washed out because there's sunlight right in front of us. Okay, so it's really hard to actually see, but you're going to see this in a little bit. This is our car driving. It's, 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 uh, uh, and what you're going to see, this is the car coming up the other way. Okay, so this is a human-driven car. So you can see what a human-driven car actually does when a robot's coming at it. It pulls over as far as you can. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but the nice part about what we did is, uh, is that we slowed down and we moved to the right. We did exactly what you know, a human driver would do. And this is something we never had tested before. So, so if I think about the definition that I have given in terms of, uh, you know, intelligence or intelligent autonomy, um, this did a pretty good job because it was something I had never seen before. Um, it wasn't too far away from some of the things we've seen before, but it was a car coming at it, and it was coming on a road that uh, it shouldn't have been there. Okay, so we were actually pretty happy uh, that something like that happened. Um, but, I, but I have to uh, come back to the collision again, right? Because, uh, you know, that still is the, the, the big thing that uh, keeps you up at night. So, um, so even though we had some algorithms and we did some nice job in planning and reasoning, um, we tried to model our best in terms of how humans do this, we still had some, some problems. So then, um, so the question is why? So um, I'm going to go back again to the idea of reasoning, okay? If, if, if you haven't gotten it, that's the, uh, the theme for the night. Um, and, and so I'm going to talk about reasoning now, not just in terms of now this prediction, predicting what cars are going to do, but also figuring out what I want to do. Okay, um, so the best example I can give you, this is the same picture that I had before where I'm coming up to this intersection and this is the obstacle and it can go two different ways. Now what I have to do is I have to figure out whether I want to slow down or if I want to quickly go to the left or I want to slow down and then go behind it or I want to stop. Okay, so there's different things that I could do. Okay, um, and again, so, so you can imagine the challenge of this problem because you kind of have this explosion, right? How far in advance do I predict these in time, and how far in advance do I predict these in time? Okay, computationally, it gets really, really hard. It, it just, it's just a problem that doesn't really scale very well. And so that's really why very few groups at, at, at all during the 2007 competition did anything like this. Okay, there was a little bit that was actually done, uh, but not really uh, all that much at all. And some of it was computational, and some of it was just, they're just really, really hard problems to solve. And I think there's uh, a portion of the research community that's addressing this right now. Okay, so, so um, this is an example of something that we call contingency planning. Uh, so there's a few groups uh, around the country that are looking now at probabilistic planners. Uh, they sometimes call it planning over uncertainty. There's different ways of doing this. The easiest probably way to think about this is a sample-based planner. Very similar to why, where I would have hypotheses of things that are in the environment. I can have hypotheses about which uh, action I should take. Okay? Uh, and the way we do it is, is we have different hypotheses of the actions we want to take, but the very first time step is the same of all of them. So we sort of uh, hedge our bets, if you want to think of it that way. So this is the robot as it's coming in. You can see a couple different lines. Uh, I'll wait for this to you know, just do this and start it over. So we're coming in. You can see a couple different hypotheses. One is slow down. One is to sl uh, go to the left. And these are the obstacles in which way they're actually moving. Okay? And, and predicting and those types of things. So you see three different predictions as we're coming into, as it's coming into the intersection. So the idea here is to try to figure out uh, computationally efficient ways of doing the, the reasoning part, both for perception and in planning in one type of framework. And those are the, uh, at least some of the things we're actually trying to address. Okay, so I want to just touch on a couple things before I get to the conclusions. Um, these are uh, some extensions. Um, and uh, uh, just hopefully I'll, I'll tie them together and you'll be able to see how those work. So the first is, this is, this is some work by a colleague uh, also from Cornell, Hadas Kraskazit. Um, she works in the area called um, verification and validation, um, or touches on that at least in terms of her work. Okay? So the, the best way to explain it, and if you work in the aerospace industry, if you develop a product, it's a, it's a, um, you probably know these words, 
Um, the question is, what, it, the easiest way to, for me to explain is, what if you want to add one more capability? Okay? This might be a missing capability, a new situation, or maybe you want to learn over time. Okay? Uh, so like at the competition, um, we had been uh, working on the car for a year and a half. right? And we wanted to make a couple of small adjustments to the code. But we couldn't do a lot of testing. right? So you can imagine the sweat we had in terms of small little changes to the code at that point, because you don't know the impact that, ha that will have on other portions of the code. Okay? That's what regression testing is for and all those types of things. So um, those are the things that we're really, really, uh, that we were struggling on. So the question is, is there any way to guarantee the same or better performance compared to what you did before? This is what learning is all about. I mean, that's the beauty typically of somebody who learns, is that they'll go better and better and better in their performance, right? Um, so one approach is these things called logic-based specifications. And uh, this is embedded in some, some theory uh, called hybrid systems theory, uh, uh, which bring together discrete automaton as well as continuous kind of controllers. So um, uh, I don't want to get too much into detail on this, but, but the idea here is that if you had a map and you had a robot and you had a set of goals and you had a set of rules, you have all this um, uh, infrastructure here and you encode all of the goals and those types of things into logic and you automatically generate the code. Okay, it's the easiest way to think about it. So you can imagine we can only do this for fairly simple problems right now, but the hope is that you can um, increase it uh, as, as you go along. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you an example of where we started putting this together so th in terms of a collaboration that I have uh, with R Professor Kreskazit. So the, um, what we did is we took our anticipation algorithms, our prediction, and then we embedded it as a specification inside of uh, her logic-based approach. So the idea here now is the, th the knob that you get to change, the goal, is what is your uh, probability of collision? And at least in these simple examples, these are guaranteed. Okay? So, um, and I'm going to give you three different probabilities of collision, 1%, uh, and I think 0.01% and 10%. Okay? So you can think of this now as how aggressive of a driver you are. right? That's really what it is, right? I mean, how close do you want to get to other cars and those types of things? You're changing your, uh, your ability, your probability of collision. And this is a specification. This is a goal, OK? So this is the first one as we're coming along. And this is actually, I think this is the same one we've actually seen before. So you can see I'm predicting which way I'm going to go. You can see these things. Um, and um, I basically wanted to keep going straight, OK? Now, this is with a very, very small collision probability. That means I really want to just stay away from the other car as much as I can. Okay? So the first thing I do is, really what I want to do at this point is, I don't want to drive past it. I want to go right. Okay? So I'm just avoiding it. Right? And then the third one is 10%. Right? And so you can imagine actually what's happening here is that uh, really I'm trying to go up. We set a goal point up in here. Okay? And so you can see what happens is you basically cut off at that point. Okay? And so you're starting to see behaviors very similar, you know, good or bad, uh, to maybe what you actually see. Um, uh, in the three different cases, if I want to go right here, the aggressive one goes this way, the medium one goes this way, and you know, the scaredy cat goes that way. Right? Um, so, um, so as we're putting it all together, there's still some challenges. They're very, very simple problems. We're actually testing these right now on the robot in a, in a, uh, a very controlled environment. <laughs> Um, the other cars, actually, we call them ghost cars because they're simulated cars. They're actually really driving them um, with a wheel and things like that. But we're not going to drive another car that close to, uh, to our robot. So there's still challenges. Model fidelity, these ideas of trust that I've already talked about, how, the, how everything scales in terms of more uncertainties and complexity and so on. So um, uh, just going to mention, um, uh, or I want to talk uh, finally just in terms of one slide in terms of learning. I did talk about learning at the very beginning, uh, and I only have one slide on it. You might ask why that is, and, and the main reason is, is I, just, I don't do a lot of research on that. Uh, I do a lot more on the perception and the reasoning uh, that you've already seen. Um, but there's a big group uh, across the country and across the world really looking at learning methods. And uh, I'm going to give you one example from a colleague, Peter Beal, who uh, did his uh, grad work at Stanford and, and is currently at Berkeley. In fact, he's taking part in the uh, Kavli workshop tomorrow. Um, uh, but the idea here is that humans drive well because they learn over time. They get better and better and better over time. Okay? Now, granted, they have a big computer up in their head, okay? so you've got to factor that in. in. Um, but this idea of learning is, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a big um, part of the community right now. So the question is how you do that. So he worked on this thing called apprenticeship learning. So apprenticeship learning, is the idea is that they'd have a stunt uh, helicopter pilot would fly these things around, 
and you'd collect all that data, and then you'd, uh, you'd uh, derive models and controllers that could then mimic the whole thing. So this uh, is a video of, after they've done that, of them doing basically acrobatics with their automated controllers. And so you can imagine you know, how hard this is. I mean, there, there's not a lot of people that can actually do this by hand, and this is all being done after they've actually learned the controller. So it's really pretty phenomenal, I think. Okay? And so, the, so in, in my mind, I mean, I think this is really great stuff, which is really why Peter's here uh, in the next couple of days. The key challenge in these areas is how you learn safely and how do you learn robustly. Because that's the thing that typically humans do, is, is they, is, if you learn, you're not going to typically hurt some other part of your performance. Um, and finally, before the conclusions, I say don't forget about us, which is the, the people. Um, there's a big part of my research that looks at the interactions with humans with robots. And uh, so obviously I'm not talking about that today, but the bottom line is, is when you're talking about autonomy, one of the key elements is how does autonomy integrate with the human? Um, so I got a few sort of fake examples in here, uh, a few goal examples down in here, and then one realistic example. This is one person trying to fly a single UAV uh, on a tracking mission. And you can see basically what they have. They have multiple monitors and, and uh, just gobs and gobs of data and so on, right? And so this isn't necessarily set up for optimal performance, uh, you know, not, certainly not a symbiotic relationship between the human and the automation. Um, so there's a lot of issues here, uh, reliability, natural interactions and trust and, and those types of things. I mean, the, you know, the, the question I pose to you or to, to people is, you know, when will you trust a car to drive you home tonight, you know, tonight or to work or something like that, right? It's a very interesting question, right? Um, and, uh, and you know, depending on how risk averse you are, some people are you know uh, would go with it or not. Um, and and when I ask that question, I, I really get a wide variety of answers. Um, uh, but there's another question you can ask: is w when would you feel comfortable having a robot interact with your kids, right? Um, and even though I work in this area, I would say no and no to both, <laughs> at least at this point, right? Um, it's a, it's a challenging thing, but the, the main thing is, is that there's a, there's a lot of really good research in here. There's a lot of connections to cognitive scientists and so on. Um, so it's really, uh, really pretty, good, um, uh, pretty good fruitful area as well. So in, in conclusion, um, I, I think you know, my personal opinion is the current autonomous systems are certainly on the verge of intelligence. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a uh, subject to debate what intelligence means and where, and where we are. Um, but certainly some of the examples I can see out there, and I've just given a sampling from mine. There's a lot of other uh, groups out there that are, that are working on things, and, I, and, and there's some really great examples. I think there's still some key challenges. I'm going to list out five. Um, the first one is just complexity in the environments. The environments I showed you here um, were, uh, in our examples, were pretty benign. We didn't have people. We didn't have cyclists, those types of things. We weren't driving through Harvard Square, if you've ever driven through Harvard Square. Um, so uh, you know, once we can drive through Harvard Square, then I think we've challenged. Uh, or we've we've we, we can check this one off. Um, verification, validation, which I've already talked about. How do you how do you make sure that you've you've uh, validated your software if you want to make some changes? Probabilistic reasoning. So this is sort of my core, the core of my research thing we've been doing, both in terms of perception and planning, and, and basically having them work together. Learning. Um, uh, put another picture of my niece in there. Uh, anything that can learn as well as an eight-year-old is a step up, right? You know, if you can get to that point, you're in pretty good shape. Uh, and then the integration with the humans. And so what I look, really look forward to is, is uh, really understanding what these things, uh, I'm excited to see what these things will look like in the future and hope to be a part of it. Um, so just final acknowledgments uh, in terms of uh, some of the groups that have funded my research. Uh, but the main acknowledgment are, are these folks, my students. and. Uh, uh, a few too many to list, but they're, they're here on my website. Thank you very much.